Monticello Christian Church family. We're glad that you've joined us this Sunday morning for our online worship service, especially if you're a visitor with us. We'd like to say a very special welcome to you as we begin our Sunday worship service. A few announcements before we begin. We want to remind you of our second Sunday fun day, which, as the name implies, will be on the second Sunday of the month during the summer, and we're hoping that it will continue through the school year. Uh, it's going to begin June the 13th, and we're going to have just a time of family fun and fellowship here at the church. It will be located over at the Forge and in the parking lot. Uh, you're invited to come and uh, bring your friends, bring your family, bring a few lawn chairs for some much-needed time of fellowship. Looking forward to seeing everyone there. There's going to be water and snacks provided. We also want to make sure that you are aware of kind of a two-part announcement that we've been sharing over the past couple weeks. First, we're getting our parking lot repaved, and we're glad about that. There's some work that needed to be done, and that's going to be getting accomplished around the 14th of June. And so the week following that time we have it uh, getting repaved, we need to stay off of it so it stays nice and has time to cure. So that time period encompasses a Sunday. That Sunday is June the 20th, just so happens to be Father's Day. And so we will not have services here at the church campus on June the 20th. We will be at Cent Arbor for one service that will be at 10 a.m. at Cent Arbor on June the 20th. So all are invited to join us there for our worship service, but we will still have a online worship service if this is how you join us in worship. Let's begin our time in worship with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this day, having seen the miracles of your everyday creation in our world. We've enjoyed both the bright sunshine and the gentle rains of this season. We've marveled over the beauty of flowers and the complexity of what you have created around us. Make our hearts ready to receive your word for us, that we may go forth from this place, ready to joyfully serve you all the days of our life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. to support each other in the way that we sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron, by the way that we encourage and edify each other, by the way that we correct each other, and by how we lift each other up in prayer. This is why each week we take time to lift our prayers, not only for ourselves unto the Lord, but on behalf of those that we know. Let us pray for ourselves and others. Lord, in this season of growth that we're in, open our hearts to grow in your love Help us to truly trust in your creative process in our life. 
We look around and we see the beauty of this world. We see the blossoming of the flowers and the plants. We see children grow. We see the joy of celebrations of graduation and marriage of receiving new life. We also see the sadness and sorrow that has invaded our world when injustice and hatred claim people's lives, when times of great sorrow and loss invade our lives, the times when discord and chaos seem to reign in our individual lives and in our lives corporately. Lord, forgive us when we see your miracles around us and still doubt your power and your presence and your love. Forgive us when we treat this world and each other just with careless indifference, with malice. You who have created the most wondrous things from the smallest of particles can, can create in our hearts confidence and hope. For it was you that breathed into us your breath of life, your very spirit. From our lives, you can fashion the most beautiful miracles that can serve you through acts of mercy and kindness. Free us, Lord, to receive your blessings, and having received them, to find the numerous ways in which we can serve you. Heal our wounded hearts, hear our cries, come to us and bring us home, Lord. We lift this morning to you the names of those who are on our prayer list. Be with them, Lord. Be with those who we name in our hearts, whom we love. And be with us as we lay ourselves at your mercy in the silence of our hearts now. Prepare us, O Lord, to become ambassadors of peace and hope. Help us to place our trust in you so that when we are serving others, they may come to know your abiding love and power. Give us courage and great joy as we serve you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, for it was he who taught us to pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
this morning, let us cast our gifts as well as our very crowns before the Lord as we return a portion of what the Lord has given us back unto the one who gave it to us. We present our gifts as grateful members of the family of God, blessed by God's gracious provision. We lay our crowns down knowing that we are blessed to be a blessing. May we find ourselves humbly and graciously offering unto the Lord not only our material possessions, but our immaterial possessions as well. Indeed, the only earthly crown Jesus ever wore was a crown of thorns. It didn't bring him honor. It didn't bring him praise from people. Rather, it brought him shame and it amplified his pain. Yet it was through his suffering that Jesus received the spiritual crown. It was through the suffering that, that we saw who he really was. That he was indeed, always and ever will be, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And is seated at the right hand of the Almighty at this very moment, looking down on us. And so we take time this morning to remember, to remember his death. The death that was ours to begin with. But Christ took it upon his shoulders. It was on the night when Christ was betrayed when he shared a meal with his disciples. And he first took a loaf of bread. And after giving thanks to God for it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body which is broken for you. And as often as you shall eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. He then took the cup and in like manner gave thanks to God for it. Gave it to his disciples and said, This is my blood which is shed for you. And as often as you shall drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Let us take time this morning, a time of remembrance to recall Jesus' coronation that began on a hillside outside of Jerusalem. The bread and the cup, they evoke this mental image of Christ, his broken body, his shed blood on a hill, hanging on a cross for us. Let us give thanks for the grace offered to us. Let us give thanks for his presence with us this morning. Let us give thanks for the salvation given to us now and forever through his death and resurrection. Amen. from Ephesians chapter 6 beginning at verse 13 therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace in addition to all this, take up your shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. 
and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. This is the Word of God for you, the people of God. We begin this morning with our series on the armor of God. The, the armor of God is, is what we have just kind of heard that is made up of several different pieces of armor and weapons. And it calls to mind this image of a Roman legionnaire. Now, this, this epistle, uh, the, the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, it's known as a, as a part of the group called the prison epistles. And not surprisingly, the reason why it's called prison epistles is because these letters were written while Paul was in prison. No doubt Paul was under arrest in Rome and no doubt within sight, if not chained to a Roman soldier. So as he's writing down these, these, uh, these pictures of, of pieces of the armor, he's witnessing before him. He's seeing before him these soldiers. This armor, this analogy of, of what we as believers are supposed to put on each day, it seems strange that we are called to do this as well as to be peacemakers. Why would Paul use armor to, to give us this imagery if we're also called to be people who bring peace into the world. I think most definitely it would resonate with the original audience, with the listener who are hearing this. These are images they see living in the Roman Empire. They would see these legionnaires walking around and they would be reminded that like those soldiers put on their armor, so should we Put on our spiritual armor, for we are in and amongst a spiritual battle each day. There's no denying that. Many times we seek to take our life, our ordinary life, and separate it into two parts. To separate it into the physical life that we have, and then this sort of elevated life, which is our spiritual life. I would say that those two are united that we are both a physical person as well as a spiritual person, and we live those lives consecutively. Only when the, this physical life, this body that we're occupying, passes away do we enter into our eternal spiritual life. We see this passage laid before us. We see the pieces. That's what we're seeking to see before us each of the weeks that we go through to see what this piece of the armor is seeking to have us understand why, why should we place this piece of armor upon us so that we can understand the message most clearly that we're trying to gather here. So the first week, this first week is the belt of truth. This, this uh, piece of armor, why are we needing to put on each day truth as a belt? You see, when it comes to armor, it's the same in the armed services today, as well as when it, this was being written by Paul, the army that they're a part of, the grouping of, of the military, they give the gear to the soldier. The gear is given to the wearer. That's, that's a very key part. Now, the wearer may add other parts, but, but for the sake of the argument that we're seeking to put here and how it relates to our spiritual armor is that the gear is given to the wearer god grants us these things as we go through these pieces may we realize that we don't do this under our own strength that god does not ask us to supply any of our spiritual armor that these are things that we are called to put them on ourselves but not supply them we are called to use them but not supply them. That's a key point that we need to realize, that we are granted these things, and that we are called to put on the whole armor of God, that each piece is important, that each piece is vital. If a soldier were to go out on, onto the battlefield missing a piece of armor, he has a key piece that is hindering them in, in what lies ahead of them. The same is true of the armor that we are to put on. These pieces are vital if we are to enter into this spiritual battle. Think of the outfit that you're wearing right now. You wouldn't leave your house 
wearing anything but your, what was needed for you to wear. We need to wear clothes in civilized public. We need to wear shoes. And when we put on shoes, most shoes we need to wear, we need to have socks on. And so what would it be like if we, if we just left off our shoes and socks or if we, if we weren't wearing the, the right kind of climate-appropriate clothing? You know, this is something that we do naturally. You know, in the middle of January, before walking out that door, we grab that coat. And so as we, as we wake up, as we get ready for our day, so must we also put on the armor of God and use it as it should be done. We think of a soldier, and, and I'm going to show my, my geekiness here. Think, when I think of armor, I have to think of Iron Man. I think of Iron Man because if Iron Man didn't have a piece of his armor, well then, that is the exact place, just if it was one piece, still, that would be the one place, the flaw in the armor that his enemy would aim at. He wouldn't have the full ability to do his superhero duties without the full armor. If a soldier on the battlefield, the same thing is true. They don't have on the full armor. They have a flaw that can be utilized by the enemy against them. So that is why we are to put on the full armor of God and why we're going to go through the full armor in this series. As I said today, today is the belt. The belt in, in the scope of an armor, it holds all the many pieces together. It keeps the, the breastplate from, from moving around too much. It keeps it in place so it can do its job. It gives everything on the armor a, a, a security and a support that it needs in order to function. A belt, as we well know, it encircles a person. That, my friends, is truth. Truth should be something that encircles us. That we as believers can be seen as being bearing in our daily life. That we would be seen as being trustworthy. That we would be, be seen as people of integrity. That we would get, be supported and held secure in truth. Now, why is this so important? Why, why are we harping on something like truth? The fact of the matter is, is that Satan is going to seek to undermine and, and completely remove, if possible, our foundation. And he will do so... Not by outright lies. He is the father of lies indeed. But what is the most devastating thing that we see that Satan wields as a weapon is the half-truth. There is a great deal of truth to it, but it's not completely true. It's changed in some way. It's defective truth. It, and, and a half-truth isn't truth. If we only put half in a half of the ingredients into a cake. Do we still have a cake? No, we have a mess. We have a, a, an unpalatable hunk of something that should be thrown away. If it doesn't, if we don't have the full armor of God, we have a flaw. If we don't have the full truth, we are not bearing our armor the way that we should. And Satan can use that. We go to the very, I see that we are, we are looking at at the very first piece of our armor as truth, and I think it, it's the first because we go all the way back to the beginning. We look at the first time Satan comes onto the scene, what he wields as a weapon again is that half-truth. He says to Eve, did God really say that? He takes out of context the word of God, and if we as believers know the truth, when the gospel is used by the evil one to, to change the way that we see things, we'll know that's untrue. That is false. I know the truth. I know the one who's spoken into being. Jesus did the same thing when he was tempted in the wilderness. When Satan tried to use the word of God as a way to tempt him, Jesus spoke the truth directly to him. As I said, this belt, it holds the, bread, the breastplate Steady. The breastplate in this is representative of righteousness. Truth holds the, the righteousness upon us. That we're able to, to first trust that God offers us his righteousness. And that we are, are trustworthy in our righteousness. It, as a belt, it would support 
and uphold the shield as one has it strapped to its arm you could rest it upon in the crook of your belt the weight of the shield could be held by your belt the shield represents faith the truth helps us to uphold our faith so when our faith is shaken it is the truth that holds it steady what do we use as the only weapon as a part of this armor which is a sword the sword is hung upon the belt the sword represents spirit it represents the word of god we have to trust that the word of god if we were to wield it as a weapon is hinging upon truth we can trust that the word of god is true a a person in in this time period would be familiar with the belt because it would be um the the undergarment that they would wear as a tunic they would they would wear their regular tunic they'd put the pieces of armor on it and if they needed to move quickly if you're if you've ever seen a, a, a nativity play the tunic kind of goes past the knees and if they needed to move quickly that would hinder them they would pull the hem up and wrap it and tuck it into the belt and they would tighten the belt they would literally gird themselves up they would gird up their tunic as to free their legs so that they could charge so that they could run if we are bearing the truth we are granted freedom to move to charge to run the truth provides freedom how many times have we heard the truth will set us free if you recall to back to the times when you were younger as we all did where we tried to wield our independence and wield our words in a way that would benefit us but exclude the truth did you clean your room did you brush your teeth well i mean yes i've brushed my teeth maybe not today like you're asking but if we aren't having to remember the half-truths and the whole lies that we've spoken, we're set free. We don't have to hold on to that. If we just speak what is true, then we are no longer bound by the chains that lies can wrap us in so easily. In Christ, there is truth. And in us as believers, we are called to be people of integrity and worthy of, worthy of trust. And so we are to encircle ourselves with that belt of truth. That belt that offers us support, that offers us security, because the whole reason we're putting this on each day is in order for us to stand firm. When everything around us is changing, when all the storms are raging, we can stand firm because we are clothed in the whole armor of God. That's why this comes first. That's why we must begin with truth, because so much hinges on the truth. The first sin of the Bible was a half truth our faith hinges on the truth of the resurrection paul said if there was no resurrection if this is all a lie then what are we doing it all hinges on the truth so let us be people of truth let us endeavor to first thing clothe ourselves with god's truth it's what we're called to do and it's what paul entreats us to do as we equip ourselves and gird ourselves up in the armor of God. Let's move to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, real quick. Verse 24. Matthew, chapter 7, beginning at verse 24. Now listen to this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. When we build, when we begin when you build a house, you have to begin with the foundation. And when, when we begin our day, when we begin our, our faith journey on truth, when truth is our foundation, then we see that it is 
most logical when the rains come and the winds come, when we've girded ourselves with truth, we can stand firm. We're not going to be like those that, that build their house on the sand. And when those winds come, we're cast down. May we build our foundation on truth. So the imagery here describes the armor of God, and it includes the belt as, as a piece of the armor, which it is, but in our minds we see a belt as clothing. We see it as an accessory. You know, be like, well, I, 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 am I going to wear the brown belt, or am I going to wear the one with the cool buckle? I think if we are to see truth, especially today in the right context, we need to see it as a weapon. Now, the only weapon that is described in this grouping here is the sword of the Spirit. But may we see within our life that truth can be a weapon. That truth strikes out against deceit. That truth is stronger and more sharper and more powerful than lies. Lies can be defeated by truth. It's a simple logic. But if we are walking into our day, walking through our life bearing that truth... That the lies around us can be cast down, for they are built on sand. And if we have built our life, we've built our faith on the truth, then we will see them cast down as it should be. If Satan can wield deception as a weapon, then may the Lord use truth to defeat those lies. And we encounter them every day. They come in through screens. They come in through the people around us. They come in from our own minds. When we look in the mirror and we say, that person is ugly, that person is garbage, that's a lie. When you look in the mirror, you're looking at something handcrafted by the hand of God, from the mind of God. And you have value beyond all understanding. When you hear the lie that, well, how do we know there is, no, there is a God? There is no God. God is dead. That's a lie. The truth, the power, the glory, the grace, the mercy, the love that we experience from God assures us of that. When we gird ourselves with truth, we're able to see the lies around us defeated. When we see the truth of Christ in our life, when we experience within ourselves that undeniable movement of our spirit and the understanding that we, beyond all hope, beyond all understanding, that we have been forgiven, that Christ has taken the debt of our sin from us, and that we can see the truth of the righteousness placed upon us, that we have been forgiven, that in our confession of Christ, in the truth of that statement, we are set free. If this morning you would seek that, you would seek to be set free and to begin the journey of becoming a person of truth, a person of righteousness, a person of the gospel, I would I would ask you to take this moment right now to confess Christ as your Savior. To confess that, Jesus, I believe that you are my Savior and Lord. I believe that you were raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that you have forgiven me. Confess Christ. Build your life on the foundation that is truth. See the lies around you defeated by the truth of God. And may we each day acknowledge the Lord that has placed us here with a mission and equipped us with the full armor of God. Let's put it on this morning and each morning to come. Onward through the rest of our lives. Let us be girded by truth. In his name. Amen.
bear his truth into the world with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.